Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about molecular orbital diagrams, but how those molecular orbital diagrams start building towards the bulk phase. What happens when we go from just two atoms in a diatomic molecule to three atoms to four to eight to 16 to a billion? What does the molecular orbital diagram look like and how does that sort of evolve into band structure? So that's the point of this lecture, going from a molecule to the bulk. And if we talk about the energies of the electrons and the molecular orbitals, maybe we can think about lithium, a pretty simple atomic system. There's one S atomic orbital, the 2S, but if we wanted to draw an MO, uh, MO diagram for lithium-2, we can do so by thinking about maybe just the 2S electrons, right? So here is a 2s lithium atom and there's another of course in the diatomic lithium atom here and that has a 2s atomic orbital and now these two atomic orbitals of course can combine to form two molecular orbitals right we've talked a lot about this in a previous video and of course this is bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals so if we think about drawing the picture of what can happen, this is bonding down here and antibonding up here. The lithium atoms, these two S orbitals, generally look like these spheres, right? So it makes sense that when these spheres come together in the bonding case, you're going to get this sort of shape. Those two spheres kind of merge into each other. Here are the two nuclei, and this would be my bonding molecular orbital, where the antibonding would have a node down the middle, and there'd be this kind of pushing away of this electron density, and there'd be opposite signs to this lithium's atomic orbital forming this molecular orbital, and this lithium's atomic orbital forming this molecular orbital. Okay, so there's your bonding and antibonding for lithium-2. This is sort of review from previous videos. Now, if we wanted to take this lithium-2 and sort of extend this to lithium-3, if two atoms and two atomic orbitals make two molecular orbitals, then it makes sense that three atoms, three atomic orbitals, make three molecular orbitals. And it turns out that the three molecular orbitals we would care about here would basically be the following. Okay, the lowest in energy is when all of these lithium atoms have the same sign, and there all are no nodes, and so these things all sort of get together and form this one molecular orbital. Okay, so I'm going to draw these sort of as separate atoms here just to illustrate the point, but you know these are sort of going to uh, smear into one another, much like they did down here. Okay, the second molecular orbital that'll be formed is when two of these atoms have the same sign. And one of them has a different sign. And so there becomes one node right here. And the highest molecular orbital that is formed, well, is gonna be when there are two nodes and essentially no overlap between any of the atomic orbitals that make up the molecular orbital. Okay, so here's the three different molecular orbitals that combine from the three different lithium atoms to S atomic orbitals. Three atomic orbitals, three molecular orbitals. And the energy of the molecular orbitals increases with the number of nodes. On a diatomic, we see there's zero nodes and one node, but the trend's gonna be the same in terms of increasing energy with increasing nodes in three atoms or four atoms, etc. And so maybe it's not lithium-3 we're thinking about, maybe it's lithium-8. And we can think about all the different combinations of the atomic orbitals 
that make up the different eight molecular orbitals. Okay, we won't draw them all, but we can draw two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Maybe we'll draw the top highest energy one and the bottom the lowest one, energy one. And so the lowest energy one is going to be one where there are no nodes. So all of these have the same sign. There's overlap between each of these atomic orbitals. And so you have one big molecular orbital that gets formed here. And the electrons are sort of delocalized over that whole molecular orbital. Okay, I'm going to erase the molecular orbital and just show the eight atomic orbitals, but you get the overlap, sort of creating this sort of picture like we had in the diatomic, but for all eight overlapping. Now, zero nodes down here. The highest energy molecular orbital that's going to be formed, well, that's going to be formed when every other atom is blue and between those blue are reds right the sign of the weighting coefficient if you go back and watch the previous lectures on molecular orbital theory and molecular orbital diagrams we talked about the sign of these atomic orbitals it can be positive blue negative red and when they're the same sign, you get bonding. When they're the opposite sign, you get antibonding. In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes. And so you can fill in the gaps for these other six molecular orbitals that would have one node, two node, three node, four node, five node, six node, seven nodes. Okay, so you can draw the other six molecular orbitals formed here from these eight atomic orbitals comes eight molecular orbitals. Now, importantly, when we draw these molecular orbital diagrams, right, we know lithium has a single 2s electron. There it is in each atom. And so we're going to fill up the lowest energy molecular orbitals first. These are all on this sort of energy axis. And so both of these atomic orbitals go into the bonding molecular orbital. And so lithium-2 is stable. Okay, for the same reason, we could fill up in lithium-8, and we'll fill up the four lowest molecular orbitals. And so orbital 5, 6, 7, and 8 here will be unoccupied. Okay, so these eight valence electrons from the eight lithium atoms become eight molecular orbitals, four of which are occupied, four of which are unoccupied. And just to introduce some terminology here. This is still an energy scale, right? Increasing vertically. And so we have a special name for a couple of these molecular orbitals. This one right here, okay, is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And this next one is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And the gap between these two between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is called the homo lumo gap. Okay, and so this is the terminology you see in smaller molecules, whether it's two atoms or eight atoms or 15 atoms, it's still very much this quantum picture, isolated atoms bonding together. You don't have a bulk phase yet. You don't have band theory, which we're building towards. You have this molecular orbital picture and molecular orbital diagram and a gap between the highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And this Homo Lumo gap tells you something about the electronic structure, what kind of light is going to interact with this system. Well, it depends on this Homo Lumo gap, this difference in energy is going to tell you sort of the lowest type of electronic transition that can happen, the least energy electronic transition, and also the most likely electronic transition. 
is to take this highest occupied molecular orbital and move it into the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It takes the lowest amount of energy. Yes, you could move one of these electrons way up here, but that's a more uh, energetic process. And so usually you're transitioning between the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied. And the difference in energy tells you the kind of lighter color of light that causes that process. Now we can move beyond, of course, two atoms and three atoms and eight atoms. And we can think about, well, what if we have a mole of lithiums? Okay, so let's take 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd instead of lithium 2 or lithium 8. Let's have lithium 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? And you can think about all the molecular orbitals that are possible there, but it would take you uh, longer than the history of the Earth to draw all those molecular orbitals and a diagram. But what we can say is we can sort of extrapolate here and say that there's going to be one mole molecular orbitals from this one mole of atomic orbitals. And there's going to be one mole of these states. Okay, now you're going to sit here and watch me draw one mole of lines. Just kidding. There's 20 or so. But assume this is going to be one mole of molecular orbitals. Linear combinations of those atomic orbitals creating the different bonding and antibonding type molecular orbitals. But the states are so dense here, they're so, so closely packed together, right? I can't even draw a mole of these, but you know, assume that the energies are really close together. And that's something I should have pointed out here, is that while there's a large gap here between the HOMO and LUMO, this gap shrinks when I go from two to three to eight. And so once you become a mole, Right? The gap between all these states really goes down these large density of these states. is basically continuous. So in quantum mechanics, right, everything in terms of energy is quantized. But, you know, at some limit, it's beyond our ability to measure the gap between these two states, between two successive states. So here the density of states is, is so close. There's so many states so close together. We can assume this is sort of a continuous distribution and not any real quantized separation here in terms of delta E because this delta E is going to zero essentially. So this is quasi-continuous. And so we call this a band. When the states are so closely packed. And the number of molecular orbitals per some bandwidth is the official density of states. Because you'll see this in solid state chemistry quite a bit. How many molecular orbitals are there in this area? Count them up. What is the overall spread and energy from the top state you're counting to the bottom? Divide those two numbers, that is the density of states. Okay, so this is just some terminology, whether it's homo lumo gap in a very molecular structure or a sort of density of states here in a band theory or solid state structure that comes from these molecular orbitals being so closely spaced together. So for lithium here, when it's a mole, we know just extrapolating from lithium 2 to 3 to 8. Since each lithium is a half-filled atomic orbital, we're going to get all these molecular orbitals, half of which are filled and half of which are empty. 
Okay, so here I'm using red to denote empty molecular orbitals. And here I'm denoting blue to denote filled molecular orbitals. And so sometimes you'll just see like this shaded to denote it's filled. And sometimes you'll see the empty states uh, open or shaded a different color. So one mole of electrons is what we're dealing with here. If we have one mole of lithium, each lithium with one electron, then there's a mole of electrons. And that mole of electrons is half filling the mole of molecular orbitals since two electrons fit in each molecular orbital. But this is a little simplistic, and it's a little simplistic because we're not considering any of the other states of lithium. So while, yes, the atomic orbital is the 2s, there can also be a 2p state of lithium. Yes, it's higher in energy. And so if we look at this 2s state of lithium compared to its 2p atomic orbitals, this is my energy scale here. This is the atomic orbital picture. We can imagine that, you know, these 2s states that originally go to bonding and antibonding, or the three states that go to three, or the five lithiums that go to five molecular orbitals, or the eight that go to eight, eventually, right, this extrapolates. to a band here. Half of which is filled. So that's what we were seeing on the previous diagram here for just the 2s atomic orbitals filling up filled a uh, half filled uh, s band built from the s atomic orbitals but there's also going to be one built from the p orbitals And some of the p orbital overlap is going to be very favorable. And some is going to be unfavorable, bonding and antibonding character. In any case, this will extrapolate to some states way down here, all the way up to the top. And so we'll draw this as a separate. band. And this would be the 2p band here, as opposed to the 2s band here. Okay, so now we have two bands that have emerged from two different atomic orbitals. Of course, these atomic orbitals were occupied. The 2p orbitals and lithium were unoccupied. These are the bands over here on the right that these evolve into. And how much they overlap right here is exactly related to this gap. So the overlap is proportional to the sp atomic orbital gap or energy gap. and the distance between the two atoms. Okay, so keep in mind here, right, we're going from just a simple single lithium atom to bulk phase, think of solid lithium. Now, where these bands are depends on how close together the lithium atoms are, right? Because if you go back and think about molecular orbital theory, the overlap of electron density is good. The closer the atoms are, the more overlap there is. 
Now you also get some internuclear repulsion from the nuclei, but remember there's some sweet spot where there's a minimum in energy based on the internuclear distance. So in the solid, this internuclear distance, along with this atomic sp gap, really determines how much these uh, bands sort of grow up and down from the atomic orbitals, and if they overlap or not. So a closer interatomic distance, again, would mean more wave function overlap, which widens the band. So wider bands will emerge from closer interatomic distance. Because there's more overlap of the wave function, which can be better and lower the energy more, so the band might go down to here, but it can also be equally unfavorable and the band can go up. So the band will become wider the more the wave function overlaps. Now, different types of elements, if it's not lithium, but maybe it's magnesium, or maybe it's aluminum, or maybe it's carbon, okay, will give rise to different sorts of bands. So we can think about, here's lithium, the first type we might think about. And lithium is going to have a partially filled lower band. And we call this lower band the valence band. Because it's the one emerging from the valence electrons in lithium. Now, since the levels of the valence band are continuous, you can think about how easy would it be to promote an electron, right? If you were thinking about a homolumo gap, we said there's this gap in energy. So think about the analogous situation here. How much energy would it take to move an electron right here at the top of this valence band to the next available state? Okay, it takes almost no energy here to promote an electron from the top of the filled molecular orbitals right here to the next unfilled. And so since there's a bunch of states, remember, here as well, still in the valence band that can accept electrons, the promotion or the movement of electrons within this lithium compound is very easy. I should write very little energy required to promote an electron to an unoccupied state. We call that a conductor. Which is a property of most metals. The second situation that might arise is something like magnesium. Okay, for magnesium, we'll have a very similar situation as this. But in magnesium, you can go back and think about this is two electrons. So I get two electrons per atomic orbital, which means I get two electrons in every molecular orbital, which means all of this would be filled. So the valence band is completely filled in magnesium. All right, so our energy diagram would look something like this. Here's my valence band for magnesium. It's completely filled. Now, I still have this upper band, which we'll call the conduction band, that overlaps but it's completely empty. So the situation here for magnesium is a completely filled valence band, not half filled like lithium.
but this completely filled valence band overlaps with this upper band. And this upper band we call the conduction band. Now, there's still no real gap between the occupied and the unoccupied states. So still, approximately no energy required to promote an electron. So this also is a metal conductor. And this, of course, we already know lithium and magnesium are metals, but now we see it borne out. Okay, there's no band gap in either of these cases, one or two. No band gap in magnesium, and no band gap here for lithium. Okay, so this is a little bit different than our atomic orbital case where we, uh, or molecular orbital diagram, where we really talk about bonding and antibonding. Because even if you look at the case of lithium, while this we would call bonding and this we would call antibonding, how do we characterize this one in the middle, right? It sort of has some bonding character and some antibonding character. So once we go up outside of these simple polyatomics or diatomics, we stop using this terminology bonding and antibonding and speak more about being within a band, either conduction or valence band. Okay, so the exact type of molecular orbital or the exact band you promote to kind of depends on what's next available. Here, you're still going to this 2S state, so it's still within an S band. We wouldn't call it a bonding state or an antibonding state because the electronic structure is much different now that we've entered the bulk phase. There is this sea of electrons and a sea of molecular orbitals, too high to count. So we just call it this collective band. Okay, so this is lithium and magnesium. There's a couple other examples we can think about. Case 3 and case 4 we'll do together. We can think about having a filled... valence band, but separated from an empty conduction band. And that would look something like this in band theory. Here's my valence band, and it is completely filled. If it's not completely filled, well, then it's going to be a metal and you can promote within here. But if it's completely filled and now it's separated in energy and there's a definitive gap here between my valence band and my conduction band, well, now we have a different situation and we call this the band gap. which clearly, you know, is sort of similar in our molecular orbital diagram speak to the homolumo gap, right? It's just in molecular orbitals, we have these distinct quantized energetic states. And here there's a continuous amount of states, but separated in energy from another continuous amount of states. Okay, so these are not conductors, and this really shouldn't be filled. I'm sorry about that. This should be completely empty. And now the amount of energy it takes an electron to move from this last occupied state to an unoccupied state is the band gap, that energetic separation. Okay, so these will not be conductors, not be conductors. Now, if the band gap 
is say very very large we'll say this is class 3 and it depends on who you ask and what field you're in but I'm gonna say a large band gap is something like uh, greater than a few EV maybe we'll say three electron volts unit of energy we would call this an insulator and the reason is this is a lot of energy it's not likely that some thermal energy you know 300 Kelvin or even 500 Kelvin is enough energy to cross this gap and make this thing conductive so we'll call this an insulator and diamond is something that works out like this now if the band gap is something more moderate maybe we'll say uh, 0.5 EV to 3 EV or so well we call this then a semiconductor and so these are the four different sort of types of band scenarios you could have and this is something like silicon right and it's a semiconductor because we might be able to bridge this gap by raising the temperature so it might have some sort of tunability you could think of it as in terms of its conductivity okay so those are sort of the four different scenarios of the different band structures the last thing I'll briefly talk about here is taking a semiconductor like silicon where you have this moderate sized band gap between the valence band that is filled and the conduction band which is not filled and there's some reasonable band gap here maybe this is 0.5 EV or something like that you can change this band gap this band gap remember is an evolution of this SP gap so how might you affect the band gap well you affect this separation how could you affect the separation maybe you add a different element in maybe it's not purely silicon and maybe you add a few atoms in dopant atoms we'll call them where their molecular orbital is here in between what is usually the SP band gap and so if you add in molecular orbitals here those are going to evolve to be some intermediate energy and so you might end up with a molecular orbital here or a very thin band from those dopant atoms Okay, and if it's a filled one like this, well, now I've changed my band gap because now the gap is much less. It's the last occupied one of this filled molecular orbital to the conduction band. And we call that an N type dopant. Again, this is just in type four of semiconductors. Or if instead, you move the conduction band down maybe you add an unoccupied molecular orbital that evolves to be this unoccupied little band right here well now I've also reduced the band gap to this much and this we call a p-type so it's an n-type when I'm adding filled molecular orbitals and for negative there's more electrons here negatively charged p for positive we're adding empty states that don't contain negative electrons so we can think of them like holes or positive charges that's a p-type dopant in either case you're tuning this band gap by adding adding this uh, atom that is unlike the atom of the bulk and so that's what we do in semiconductors we tune that band gap by adding in a dopant either a p-type or an n-type dopant and these things might be gallium or arsenic or phosphorus or some of these other 
atoms around silicon if that is our semiconductor like it is in electronics. Okay, so here we've now sort of extrapolated here from the atom. all the way to the bulk. And there's a lot of interesting chemistry in between. Right, so we showed sort of lithium, lithium-2, lithium-3. But there's a lot of interesting chemistry in here. Lithium-4, maybe up to lithium-20 or something. Where we're in this intermediate range. It's still very quantum mechanics in nature, but your geometries, your electronic structure with each atom you add is changing a lot. So this sort of small range of maybe two atoms, I don't know, up to maybe a couple hundred atoms or so, we don't call atoms, we don't really call molecules, we don't call the bulk, a lot of times we call these clusters. And so this intermediate size regime is really fascinating because there's lots of tunable properties just by controlling the sheer size or number of atoms. And that's why people are very excited about building these materials out of these little nanoparticles or clusters because just by changing the size of that nanoparticle, you change some property. So much of my graduate school work was studying how this SP gap, which evolves to a band gap in aluminum, varied from say, aluminum one to aluminum 13. And which one along the way would you want to use if you wanted a certain application in catalysis, or in optics or electronics and really studying the molecular orbital diagram for each of these and their electronic structure. In any case, that'll do it today when we talked about band structure sort of evolving from molecular orbital diagrams, getting into these four classes of band structures like lithium and magnesium, both conductors and metals, to something like silicon, a semiconductor, and diamond, which is an insulator. That'll do it for this lecture. Next time, we'll move on to molecular spectroscopy. See you next time.